Good morning and welcome to our worship here at the Congregational Church of the Chimes on Epiphany Sunday, which is the day that we celebrate the arrival of the kings at the stable. And I also want to remind you that we're having communion this morning, which means you're welcome to have a piece of bread and something to drink and join us for the sacrament. Just a couple of announcements. One, next week will be our Zoom coffee hour, so we'll be sending out a link on Friday. So make sure you check that out and join us at 11.45 next Sunday after church so we can look at each other and chat and maybe even drink a cup of coffee. And also a reminder that we're doing our 10 at 10 Monday through Friday. They're a wonderful chance for us to be together in God's presence. So welcome. We are delighted to have you with us. Good morning and happy new year. Will you please join me in the call to worship? Blessing to God who gives hope in the darkness of our lives. Blessings to Jesus Christ who reveals God's love unto the world. Blessings to the Holy Spirit who empowers us to be a light for others. Blessings, honor, and glory to God today and forever. Will you please join me in the invocation and then the Lord's Prayer. Lord, Lord of the nations, the nations we, have we have seen the star of your glory rising in splendor. The radiance of your word pierces the night and signals the dawn of justice and peace. As the mighty knelt before you, may we be humble in a holy law at the gift of your Son. Amen. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us of our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Good morning, everyone. How are you today? Hi, kids. And just for the uh, adult women that are out there, we have a women's Bible study this Wednesday at 7 o'clock, and hopefully we'll have our new curriculum by then. And if not, I'll be scanning it and sending it. But the books will be here really soon, I hope. Um, so as Beth mentioned, today is Epiphany. And this Christmas story is the day we celebrate the visit of the Magi. Or the wise men. Not much is really known about these visitors other than what Matthew records in the first book of the New Testament. We know they were from the East and studied the stars. We know they had some knowledge of history and prophecies concerning Israel. They followed a star to Bethlehem, but contrary to all of our nativity scenes and our pageants, they probably didn't arrive until much later um, after Jesus' birth. So I found a very short story that I want to share with you. It's written by an author by the name of Harrison Woodward, which is the story of the wise men from the camel's perspective. The three camels, their names are Aaron, Nina, and Penda. So here we go. A long time ago, there were three camels named Aaron, Nina, and Penda. They wanted to travel to distant lands and visit wonderful places. The wise men that owned them rarely left the palace. Instead, they spent their days studying ancient writings and the nights searching at the stars. The three camels prayed, God, please send us on an adventure. And God answered their prayer. Several nights later, the wise men loaded their camels and headed west toward a very bright star. They traveled all through the night and into the next day until they reached an oasis. There they rested in the shade of big palm trees. Aaron said, I think I know where we're going. Where, asked the other two. My master, Melchior, placed a jar of myrrh on my back. This is a gift given to a great general, a man willing to serve his people and give his life for them if necessary. His house will be large and he will have hundreds of servants and soldiers attending their needs. The other camels nodded, you may be right. At sunset, they approached a really large house. I see, I told you, said Aaron, this must be the general's house. 
The three, three wise men spent the evening with a general who provided them with delicious food and entertainment, and the camels were treated very nicely as well. After dark, they talked with the animals in the stable. Hmm, who lives here? asked Aaron. He must be a very great man. He is my master, General Kadar, said, the, said a donkey. He is a great warrior and faithful to his king. The camels went to sleep, honored to visit such a great man's home. The next morning, the wise men continued their journey. After traveling all morning, they stopped at yet another oasis. My master did not leave his gift with General Kadar, said Nina. Neither did mine, said Aaron. I must be wrong. I think I know where we're going, said Penda. Where, asked the other two. Well, my master, Balthazar, loaded a chest full of gold onto my back, said Penda. Gold is a gift given to a king. This king must live in a fabulous palace somewhere in the west. The other camels nodded. You know what? You may be right. After seven more days, they arrived at King Herod's palace. The wise men stayed in the palace as the king's guests, and in the stable, the camels were given water and food and yet another place to sleep. See, I knew we were visiting a king, bragged Penda. The other camel said, you were right. But the next morning, the wise men continued their journey without leaving any of their gifts. I don't understand, said Penda, as they were walking along. If not a king, then who? I think I know where we're going, said Nina. Where, asked the other two. My master, Gaspar, put a container filled with a sweet-smelling frankincense on my back, said Nina. Frankincense is the gift to God. I believe we are going to a great temple, she said. There will be many people offering gifts and prayers to God. You must be right, said the other two. Later that day, they came to a great temple in Jerusalem. See, I knew we were visiting a temple, said Nina. And the other camel said, you are right. The wise men walked around the grounds and admired the beautiful structure. But after a short time, they mounted their camels and continued on their journey. Nina asked, if the gifts are not for God, then who? They had visited a great general, a king, a god's holy temple, and none were worthy of their master's gifts. Hmm, we must be visiting someone really special, said Aaron. The other camels nodded and said, you are absolutely right. It was nighttime as they approached a small town called Bethlehem. The great star had led them to a very small house. Why did we stop, said Aaron? Who could possibly live here? The three wise men knocked on the door. A man named Joseph greeted them. May I help you? We have traveled many miles to visit the new king, said Balthazar. We followed his stars, added Gaspar. We want to worship him, said Melchior. Is he here? Joseph called his wife. Mary, bring Jesus here. He has some visitors. Mary appeared in the doorway, holding a small child. This is Jesus, said Mary. The three wise men knelt down in front of Jesus, bowed their heads, and worshipped him. I have a jar of myrrh for Jesus, a gift to honor a great warrior, and the life he will give for everyone, said Melchior. Thank you, said G Joseph. I have brought a chest full of gold, a gift worthy of the new king of the world, said Balthazar, as he handed a chest to Joseph. Thank you, said Joseph. Here is a container of frankincense, a gift worthy of the Son of God, said Gaspar, as he handed the container to Joseph. Thank you, said Joseph. God has granted great wisdom to all of you. The three wise men bowed. Will you be returning to your country tonight, asked Joseph. Gaspar answered, we will spend the night at Bethlehem and leave in the morning. God bless you and protect you, said Mary, as she and Joseph waved them goodbye. That night, the three found found rooms in an inn, and they praised God for what they had seen. During the night, the camels couldn't sleep. They talked about all that had happened, and suddenly an angel approached before them. Do not be afraid, said the angel. I bring great news. What is it, asked the camels. Each of you thought you knew you were going to visit someone special. Aaron said it would be a great warrior willing to give his life to save his people. You were right. Jesus will give his life for all people. He will return and conquer all evil. Penda said it would be a great king. You too were right. Jesus is the eternal king. His kingdom will never end. Nina said, hmm, it would be God. This is right as well. Jesus is God's son, exclaimed the, the angel. Wow, exclaimed the camels. There is nobody greater in the world. We thank God for allowing them to see Jesus to be a part of such a great event. And then the angel told them, tomorrow morning I tell you, 
I will lead you home, but do not turn right or left, but follow me wherever I, wherever I lead you. And the three answered, we will obey. The next morning, the three wise men mounted their camels and tried to turn to the camels towards the north, but the camels refused. They then tried to pull them to the south, and the camels still wouldn't budge. And then Gaspar said, you know, last night I had a dream. I was warned not to go back and tell King Herod where to find the child. He wants to hurt Jesus. I had the same dream, said Melchior. How will we get home? We are to trust God, said Belsier. He will show the camels the way. And then the angel appeared in front of the camels, but the wise men could not see or hear him. Follow me, said the angel. The camels followed them all the way to their own country. Back in their home, they told all the other animals about their trip. For the rest of their lives, they praised God for choosing them for such a great adventure. Will you pray with me now? Dearest God, we thank you for the birth of our Lord Jesus. And help us, Lord, to be more like the wise men to be more open to new God-filled adventures, to be guided by the light of Jesus, and to be willing to follow him in all that we do. In his name we pray and say, Amen. Happy New Year, Church. In celebration of Epiphany, let's sing the first and last verses of We Three Kings of Orient Are. separate us from your love. We pray that our lives will be filled with and overflowing with the power of your love so we can make a difference in this world and bring honor to you. We ask for your help in reminding us that the most important thing are not what we do outwardly. It's not based on any talent or gift, but the most significant thing we can do in this life is simply to love you and choose to love others. Heavenly Father, help us to love as you love. Fill us with your spirit so that we can choose what is best. Heavenly Father, we are weak, but we know also that even when we are weak, you are strong within us. Thank you that it's not all up to us. Thank you that you equip us to face each day with the power of your love, your forgiveness, and your grace. We love you, Lord, and we need you today and every day. In your son's name we pray, amen.
as the three wise men brought their gifts to the manger, so we bring our gifts, that the life and the words and the teachings of God's Son might be made known through us and through this church. We thank you for your gifts and your continued contributions so that our ministries can be sustained and that our outreach may continue. In thanks for your gifts, let us bow our heads in prayer. Dear God, we bring you our gifts, and some is gold, and some is frankincense, and some is myrrh. But all comes from us that we might be blessings and that our gifts too might bless the community, the nation, and the world, only so that your love and your son's life might be made known through us. In his name we pray, amen. This morning our scripture lesson comes from the book of Matthew, chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. Matthew 2, 1 through 12. The Magi visits the Messiah. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed, and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people, chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judea, are by no means least among the rulers of Judea, for out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people, Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I too may go and worship him. After they heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over a place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshiped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. May God have a blessing on the reading and understanding of the word. When Christ appearing was made known, King Herod trembled for his throne. But he who was heavenly birth seeks not the kingdoms of this earth. The eastern sages saw from far and followed on his gliding star. By light their way. And by the gates confess their God. Within the Jordan's sacred flood, the heavenly Lamb in meekness stood, that he of whom no sin was known might cleanse his people from. And oh, what miracle divine, when water reddened into wine, he spoke the word, and forth it flowed, its streams the nature ne'er bestowed. For this his blood appears in me, all glory unto Jesus be, who with the and Holy Ghost forevermore. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. 
So, as the story goes, those kings saw a star. They followed the star somehow knowing that it would lead them to the newborn king of the Jews. Once in Jerusalem, they asked some people where they might find this new king of Jews, and someone said they thought it might be in Bethlehem, but we think that whoever told that person probably heard it from some shepherds who were wandering around spreading rumors. But they decided to go to Bethlehem, but not before they were beckoned to visit that crafty and jealous king, King Herod. And Herod asked them what they were up to, and he said, but after you see that king, would you come back and visit me so that I can properly honor and pay him homage? <laughs> Herod had a lot more devious plans than that, as you heard earlier. But the wise men unwisely agreed, and they headed off to Bethlehem. And when they arrived at the stable and saw that baby, they were awed and joyful. And we've seen that picture before. It's such a magnificent picture. It's painted on canvases. It's painted in words and poetry in song. It's a radiant picture. They're regal. They're majestic. We see this amazing picture when they're kneeling on the hay in a stable to a baby born of a very ordinary couple. In our mind's eye, though, they are kings, even though in the Bible you'll notice they never use the word kings. Instead, they call them magi, which is probably an astrologer, but nonetheless, they were wise and respected in whatever land they came from. So there they were, kneeling on the hay in a stable, awestruck, amazed, joyful. And then what did they do? Well, they gave the baby gifts, amazing gifts. It's a wonderful story. They gave the baby wonderful gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. It's a story that never fails to capture us, a story well worth waiting 12 days to hear. For the kings, as we like to see them, well, they're just everything a king should be. The costumes in their pageants and in the paintings are laden with gilt and gold and glitter. They're always wearing crowns. They are so spectacular that in any Christmas pageant anywhere, it's the role every child wants to play. There is so much wonder in this story. There are so many layers in this story. There are so many places that God utterly surprises us. There is so much about God and the baby and the ones who came and adored him just as we too every year at this time come to adore him. So to start the story off of, of signs of wonder, there's the star, the star that was surely beckoning them. And as astrologers, of course they'd noticed something unusual in the sky, but there was something even more unusual about this star, something that was compelling them, some holy pull that called them to follow that star. And that star, I'm convinced, is the same star that many of us saw a week ago that was allegedly Jupiter and Saturn aligning, but I have a different idea of what that star was because it got all of us to Bethlehem, didn't it? So in the story, the signs of God, there's the star, and then of course there's the journey itself, the journey westward leading, still proceeding, the journey that guided them to the perfect light. And we don't really know anything else about the trip except that they stopped in Jerusalem on their way to Bethlehem and they actually did get to Bethlehem. And then there, then there, there's nothing more significant than the awe and the reverence that those kings felt for this teeny weeny little baby. And it's the same thing that kind of completes all our own nativity scenes in our imagination, even in the crushes we put out every Christmas time. The wise men's glitter and gold, outshines even those jubilant brown-robed shepherds and dims those sweet little sheep whose white wool is actually dirty from the fields they lie in or if we're looking at our nativity scenes from the dust that we didn't undust when we took them out of their box. Yet, as in awe as we are of them, they are in awe of the baby, that tiny baby that somehow they knew was a king the king of the Jews. So it's a story, quite a story, the story of these wise men, these kings, these magi. There's a star, there's the journey, there's the awe and the reverence, 
And then, of course, there are the gifts. The gifts. The very idea that these kings would bring gifts to that little baby. And while there are plenty of jokes and plaques about the gifts that they chose to bring, one of my favorites is the idea that if it was a woman, they would have brought a casserole to a new family. But I prefer, frankly, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And then some scholars will take each of them, the gold and the frankincense and the myrrh, and assign a pretty deep theological meaning to each. But for me, it's enough to know that they were the most precious things that those kings could bring. Nothing was more valuable than what they would bring. Gold is, after all, the richest of the elements. And both frankincense and myrrh were very precious oils that were used in religious ritual and even for medicine. Oh, yes. We treasure those treasures so much so that we give them credit for creating the whole idea of gift exchange in our own lives at Christmas time. At least that's what I always understood. And then I had to wonder when I watched a movie that my girlfriend's granddaughter, who's six, insisted that we watch. It's called Claws. And it insists that the whole gift giving thing began because a lazy postman got sent to a cold place where he met a recluse toy maker, but I'm not buying any of that. I think it's because of the kings and the gold and the frankincense and the myrrh that we're all about giving gifts. And sometimes it's for better and sometimes it's for worse, but the, the gifts seem to bear the wonder of the kings ever since they knelt at the manger and presented the gold and the frankincense and the myrrh. Those gifts are entrenched in our Christmas culture in so many ways, and perhaps never so sweetly as in the story by O. Henry called The Gift of the Magi. And it's about a young couple, and cover your ears because this is a spoiler alert. There's a young couple, they don't have hardly any money, they can barely put food on the table, but they want nothing more than to give each other very special gifts at Christmas time. So, she, sells her hair to buy her husband a gold chain for the watch he treasures. However, he sells the watch so that he can buy a comb for her beautiful hair. O. Henry ends that story by writing these words. The Magi, as you know, were wise men, wonderfully wise men, who brought gifts to the babe in the manger they invented the art of giving Christmas presents. Being wise, their gifts were no doubt wise ones, possibly bearing the privilege of exchange in case of duplication. And here I have lamely related to you the uneventful chronicle of two foolish children in a flat who most unwisely sacrificed for each other the greatest treasures of their house. But in a last word to the wise of these days, let it be said that of all who gives gifts, these two were the wisest. Of all who give and receive gifts, such as they are wisest. Everywhere they are the wisest. They are the Magi. And how we long to be the Magi, how we long to share such treasures. The gifts just haunt us, just like the young couple. We want to give exactly the right thing that someone will like and appreciate and know that expresses how much we love them. And our Christmases revolve around the gifts. You know, what's the first question one little girl asks her best friend the day after Christmas, what did you get? And honestly, don't we also exchange that same question, like what'd you get for Christmas? Well, one answer to the question of what you get for Christmas was answered in what some of you have seen, the Saturday Night Live Christmas skit. It's gone viral. Perhaps because, although it is hyperbolic, it is also true, which any mother who's had an empty stocking on Christmas Day knows all about. It's a song, and the whole family is standing in front of a Christmas tree that has a huge amount of gifts. And the father and the son and the daughter are all singing and showing their presents. I mean, you wouldn't believe those kids got everything any kid could want. Legos and cars and even drones. But the chorus shows the mom like this saying, and I got a roll. 
another chorus, and I got a robe. And then at the very end, she opens it up and sees that they even bought it on sale. And then, as if a parting gesture, she points to the empty stocking. And in all full disclosure, for Christmas, I got a robe, but it's a really nice cozy robe, and I got a lot of other presents. And Jane, Teddy's girlfriend, she also got a robe at the very end, and it wasn't very nice, so that was more of a skip than mine. But usually, hopefully, by and large, we give gifts out of love. We give gifts to show thanks and appreciation. We give gifts at Christmas because we have been loved, loved by others, loved by God. And our gifts are, or we long them to be, expressions of that love. But when we see the Magi kneeling, as we watch them present the preciousness of those gifts, the gold and the frankincense and the myrrh, it gives us pause and it asks us a question. A question that has been asked and answered through the ages in poetry and song. There's a children's hymn. The wise may bring their learning, the rich may bring their wealth, and some may bring their brilliance and some may bring strength and health. We too would bring our treasures to offer to the king. We have no gifts deserving. What shall we children bring? We'll bring him hearts that love him. We'll bring him thankful praise and young souls meekly striving to walk in holy ways. Or Christina Rossetti in her poem, What can I give him poor that I am? If I were a shepherd, I'd give him a lamb. If I were a wise man, I would do my part. What can I give him? I give him my heart. The question echoes through the ages, even to us today in this time place. What can we possibly give that baby lying in the manger? What can we give to him, the Prince of Peace, the King of Kings, the Messiah, our Savior, the Christ? What is in our hearts that we can give that is worthy of him? And that question stands before us with a contemporary edge of 2021 urgency that we faithful cannot avoid. What can we give to the baby, to the Messiah, to our Savior in this coming year, in these difficult days that can possibly express our love and our faithfulness? Well, in one of those epiphanies, so to speak, three words popped into my mind. And I have to apologize, lately I've been rhyming a lot, but they just were there, these words. The words of the gifts we might give, attitude, fortitude, and gratitude. Wouldn't the world be better if we had what we call an attitude adjustment? It's been so easy, so unavoidable really, to look around and see dark and gray so thick that we can no longer see the light shining. We become, for those of you that know the story, we're more like Eeyore than Tigger, with Eeyore grumping around the forest and, and Tigger just jumping around in constant exhilaration. And, and our world hasn't changed. There is still darkness and there are still shadows and there's reason to be grumpy and depressed, but there's also beauty. There are sunrises and sunsets. There are children and laughing and children praying. There are scientists working around the world and people struggling to bring peace to all people. So maybe we should have an attitude and, and maybe it won't be fully positive because we need to be realistic, but what if we have an attitude that wears possibility and promise. So the baby knows that we have not given up on the world he has given us. We haven't decided that we'll sit on the side of the path he has laid before us instead of forging ahead, even though we know we're going to have to fall over some bumps and stumble into some holes. And, and then further, knowing that, that the year is new, but we still have plenty of stuff to worry about, we've not left that virus behind. It surrounds us, it endangers us, it scares us. And we're on the edge of a new era in our nation with a new administration, and we don't know yet what that will mean. As desperate as we are, as dangerous as the world just feels like it sometimes is. There are economic fallouts from the lockdown and stay-at-home orders that have not fully played out. The year has many, many challenges, and yet we can begin anew. But what do we need? We need fortitude. We need strength. We must have and have in so many ways already claimed fortitude. We've gotten through this last year with all its uncertainties and all its difficulties and all its dangers. 
but we can be sure that we will be careful and we will be safe as we wait while that vaccine unfolds. And we will reach out to one another despite all those things that seem to separate us. We will listen to those who are overlooked, who are oppressed, those who are compromised by others who see them as less than or don't even see them at all. And it will take fortitude and strength to speak out and act out when it's easier to be silent or to sit aside. It will take fortitude to gather, not be able to gather with the people we love and to confront the injustice we see, to live in the faith that was kindled in the manger in a stable in Bethlehem. What can we give him? We can give him attitude and fortitude and gratitude. Oh, we are grateful to God. We thank God all the time in our prayers and in our songs. We thank God for the beauty of the earth and the blessings that we have. And we even thank God when the world doesn't seem like we have a whole lot to be thankful for. We thank God most deeply for the gift of God's Son, who has made God so close to us, so real to us, and God's love so present for us. But you know, I think there's another element of this gift of gratitude that we give to God and God's Son, and it might actually be truest and realest when we're grateful and show gratitude to the people around us. I can just see God smiling when we thank someone for being kind, when we remember to write a note for the cookies that were left on our doorstep. It can even be good for us. There was a column in a end of the year, beginning of the new year uh, section of the New York Times when they talked about some of the ways to show gratitude. And I think one of the most powerful was, and I'm not sure we experienced it all the same way, but there was something called quarantine clapping. And it was a nightly ritual in cities like New York where at seven o'clock every night, people opened their windows and went on the balconies went and just clapped in thanks for all the healthcare workers and those who are risking their lives to save those suffering from the virus. And there are plenty of other ways to show gratitude. Someone asks, did you offer larger tips than usual to delivery and restaurant workers? Did you find yourself saying a heartfelt thank you to the grocery and pharmacy working, workers at checkout? When things got tough at home, did you remind yourself and your children of all the good things in your life? And it matters. It matters because it, should, it turns out by all these studies that the more you show gratitude, the healthier you are in your heart and in your soul. And the more you show gratitude, more than anything we are, I think, showing our gratefulness to God for the love God has given us that is made known through us. For our gratitude, our thanks to others is a gift to God for God's love kindles that spirit within us. And so here we are on Epiphany Sunday, joining the kings at the manger in the stable. And as they presented their gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh, so do we present all of our gifts, all that we have, all that we are, our attitude of hope and possibility, our strength and fortitude to get through the most difficult times, and our gratitude, not simply for what we have, but by being grateful to those who have given to us. And so it is that we join the wise men, the magi, the kings. Join me in singing as with gladness men of old.
through our lives seeking mercy and justice and peace. And this is the Lord's table and he is the host here. He invites you to be his guest. Whether you are a member of this church or another church or no church, there is a place for you here. So come to the table not because you are strong, but because you are weak. Come not because you are righteous, but because you sincerely love our Lord Jesus Christ and you desire to be his true disciple. Come not because you have any claim on heaven's rewards, but because in your frailty you stand in constant need of heaven's mercy and help. Come to seek a presence and pray for a spirit. Let us pray. O oh, gracious God, bless and sanctify the bread and the cup that we in faith and love and obedience may be spiritually nourished and strengthened to follow the path of your son, the host of our table. Amen. On the same night in which he was betrayed, he took the bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Take and eat this in remembrance of me. Ministering to you in his name, we share the bread with you. After they had supped, he took the cup and he said, This is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Do this as oft as you think, drink it in remembrance of me. Ministering to you in his name, we offer you the cup. Let us pray. We thank you, Lord, for blessing us with the sacred feast, for the strengthening spirit which nourishes our faith, and which refreshes our souls. Be known to us in breaking bread, but do not then depart. Savior, abide with us, and spread thy table in our heart. 